Hey everyone, my name is Carlos and today I'll be walking you through how to craft a component like the one you see here, featuring a slide image that dynamically switches as the progress bar completes its journey, unveiling the next item on the list. Plus, this component is interactive, so you can select any of the options independently. Throughout this tutorial, I will demonstrate how to build this progress bar utilizing code components and reveal a simple trick to optimize this layout for mobile devices. You can use this component as a feature section, ideal for outlining the perks of a product or service you're offering. In my case, being an illustrator, developing my own website with Framer, I've designed this layout to emulate an About Me section, where I explain the three main types of content I produce in my daily life. It's a versatile setup, suitable for all creatives, be it illustrators, graphic designers, photographers, or any other professionals seeking to present their work with a twist. So let's see how I put everything together. Looking at the layers tree, you will notice that my whole container is a stack, featuring a gap of 32 pixels and padding of 48 pixels. As a rule of thumb, I prefer to work with values that are multiples of four. Essentially, we are dealing with two main blocks here. The first one houses the title and description, and the one at the bottom is the component we'll be exploring in more detail shortly. It's crucial to point out that both extend across the entire width of the frame, but maintain a maximum width of 1140 pixels. Let's delve into the component with a double click to decipher its construction. This component consists of three variants. Observing the layer tree, we can see it's a horizontal stack divided into two main segments, one for images and one for text blocks. Worth noticing that all three images are incorporated in every variant, and I merely manage the opacity of each based on the active variant. This approach is great for creating that sleek fading effect. Let me show you real quick by hitting the preview button. Notice that it makes a very smooth transition between them. When we look at the text blocks, you will notice they are formed from another component. This component has only two states, active, which is the primary, and inactive. Analyzing the layers, you will notice the first contains the loading animation component, which we'll scrutinize shortly, and the second involves a stack I've named divider, which consists of a straightforward gray line. To make filling out this text easier, I created variables in everything. We can see this by clicking on this icon in the top tab. Note that I have these three variables plus the tap event exposed, which is essential for activating the click behavior. And if we select each one, the respective properties are highlighted on the right side as well. Let's revert our focus back to understanding the transition dynamics between the variants. If we select the primary variant, it's apparent that only the first one has the active state. In the second variant, the second text block is active, just as the third block is active in the third variant. The same is true for images. Only the ones from the active variant will be displayed at 100% opacity. To establish the clickable connections between them, those familiar with components and variants will know that you need to pick the component that will receive the click and link it to the desired variant. In this scenario, this block leads to variant 2, and this lower block is intended for variant 3. Similarly, the initial block of the second and third variants will be linked back to the first block of the first variant. This creates the interactive click dynamics between them. But we also need the variants to shift automatically after a few seconds. Achieving this is pretty straightforward. If I click on this variant, you will see it's all linked to the second through an appear event. Simply pick the event in the first drop-down, enter the required delay in seconds, and select the appropriate variant. Here 
Here we can see that the second variant is tied to the third, and the third loops back to the first. So that covers all the transition behaviors required for the component. However, we still need to figure out how to craft this progress bar. To accomplish this, we'll be leveraging the code component feature provided by Framer. In this case, I can either double click on it or single click, followed by clicking on edit code in the sidebar. However, to create a new component from scratch, just go to the Assets tab, look for Code, and click on the plus button. I give it any name here, leave the new component option selected, and then just click on Create. Since I already built this component, I will open it with this button and notice that on the right side, there is a preview displaying the result of the code I've scripted for this component. And over on the left side, we'll dissect the code in order to understand exactly what it does. The first thing it does here in this case is importing the React library and the functions we will need. Use effect and use state are functions called hooks that will help us manage the behavior and state of our component. Then we need to place the main function declaration which is the default export from this module. Within this function, we have initialized a state variable with a default value of zero using the useState hook. SetWidth is the function used to update the width state. This variable would be responsible for dynamically updating the progress bar. This code snippet creates a repetitive action that updates the bar width every 90 milliseconds. When the width reaches 100%, it will be reset to zero to create a looping animation. And this block returns a cleanup function that will be called when the component re-renders. It's a common practice for preventing memory leaks in JavaScript. Here we have the HTML, which is actually JSX code, that our component should render. The divs refer to a container that encloses two more divs, one for the background and the other for the progress bar. Inside the braces, I reference the CSS styles declared above. In other words, they will render for the user based on the layout defined in these styles. So if I go back into the component, I can see exactly how the CSS behaves visually. If I go back to my CSS code, I can change the style of these colors. I can, for example, swap these two colors here, let's say yellow for the progress bar and then green for the background. And by saving this code, we will have a component with completely different colors. Perfect. It changed the colors of the background and progress bar. However, this is not very flexible, right? I can change the layout this way, but I would like to expose these properties in the framer interface itself. This way, those without a technical background can have full autonomy to adjust the colors and timing without needing to be a programmer. Achieving this is totally feasible using property controls. From now on, I'll be pasting some new code snippets over the current one to show you how we can add this flexibility. First of all, we have to import the control properties. Add property controls is a function provided by the framer library that allows us to visually expose the properties to our users. Control type is a set of constants that defines the various types of controls that can be used. So let's paste this new block of code here at the end. For each of these properties, background color, progress color, and time animation, we will have three parameters. Title is a string that defines the name you will see in the framer UI. Type determines what type of UI control will be displayed. Framer offers a variety of control types from simple input fields to color pickers and sliders. Default value, as the name indicates, it defines the initial value of the property. As the time animation field is of type number, we can also define other options for it. And here we need to add some minor changes to the main functions as well. We introduce the concept of props so that our component can receive dynamic values. We are also reflecting those new variables that we will use as dynamic properties and assigning them as props in the code. 
And last but not least, we need to make some minor changes to the CSS. Note that background color now grab its value from the background color prop, the same way as the progress color and the time animation. Let's save it and check how all of this was translated into the interface. The preview seems to be working just fine, which is good. Let's select the component and there we have it. Now I have complete control to change the look and feel of it. I can change both the color and the opacity. Let's also modify the color of the progress bar. I can also increase or decrease the delay of the animation. Let's see how that looks. It certainly doesn't look very attractive because it was a very poor choice of colors, but it's definitely working. I will undo all changes to keep the original colors and the 9 second delay. Just remember that, if you change these parameters here, you will have to edit the delay value of the appear event too. Otherwise, one will trigger before the other, causing a misalignment in the animation timing. Before we conclude, we need to resolve the issue with mobile devices. On smaller screens, displaying all this information simultaneously is inviolable, as the layout starts to compromise. Fortunately, there is a straightforward solution. I can navigate to the stack containing all the images and create a variable to manage this behavior. I will click on Visible, select Create Variable, and assign the name Image Visible to it. It defaults to Yes. We can observe that this attribute is now highlighted. Let's now go back to the layout of my page and create two breakpoints. Tablet and Phone. Here on the tablet, I will reduce the side padding to 24 pixels instead of 48. And also adjust the minimum size to a value that reveals much more of the image. I don't want the image to appear overly condensed. Okay, this value seems to be just fine. And at the phone breakpoint, I will change the padding to 16 pixels, which is recommended in the guidelines for mobile layout. As a good practice, it is also recommended to reduce title size on smaller interfaces. Let's use 36 pixels here and 1.3 am for the line height. Notice that you can also set these rules on text styles if you want to. It looks like the paragraph has the wrong value, so let's fix it in the primary breakpoint. Be aware that any changes to the desktop will automatically affect the other breakpoints too. Now I will click on my component, locate the image visible variable I just established, and select No. Fantastic! Now on more compact displays, only the text will be presented to the user. Let's publish and refresh the browser to see how it looks on the web. You have the freedom to modify this component and establish different layout rules, if the current ones aren't ideal for your needs. But I illustrated this process to showcase how quickly we can tweak these rules within Framer, enabling the creation of a layout that is versatile and adaptive to any screen dimension. Well, that's it for today. I hope you liked this tutorial. It's a little more advanced as it involves no-code resources combined with the power of code. This shows how versatile Framer is and the level of advancement we can achieve using the tool. This definitely sets Framer apart from its competitors, making it a magical and powerful builder. 
You can find the remix link for download in the description of this video and I see you in the next tutorial.